so I'm supposed to close the module two. So the, the, the last uh, presentation of uh, the super res was asked to give a course actually on the, the quantitative aspect of single molecule location microscopy. It's not very easy. We are like crazy, uh, very, very beautiful uh, presentation from different speakers uh, going from the probe developments, uh, uh, microscopy developments, uh, and beautiful uh, application of super res. But still, a qualitative aspect uh, have not been uh, explained, so this is my, my goal here. I may be a bit long, uh, because I also want to, to show you a little bit what we're doing at the end, so at least a tiny application of, of what we're doing. But like Anne yesterday, if you are angry, feel free to, to go. But then you will have to, uh, as soon as you, I wouldn't be offense as soon as you offer me a beer. So, can, can go, no problem. Okay, so, um, Let's start with this, and of course, I will go through things that have been said already, but uh, I think this is a school, so I think this is the basic of learning is repeating, so I will repeat a few things that you already know. I'm sorry for doing so. One of that. So I'd like to start with this old story, so it was actually one of the first collaboration we had with the group of Greg, which is here, and uh, it was the, the, the work of, uh, of Olivier Rossier, when he was young and wild postdoc. So they are interested, they were, and still interested in the role of adjunct protein in different biological systems. And then we had this collaboration starting to build our first uh, super res microscope. And this is here an image, a wide field image of uh, uh, Baxilin here, which is labeled with MEO. So this is the green form here. So let's say similar to a GFP. And what you see basically is not a lot uh, of details. So it's just like there's high concentration of these molecules here at the deletion site. You can see be around the, uh, the, the membrane and that's it. And even if you make like a slight time-lapse movie, uh, of course there's not much thing that you can see from, uh, from, from this movie as well, except that maybe it's start to escape the light because it's maybe a bit too much, but that's the thing. So to analyze at least uh, some uh, information, quantitative information on the mobility, one would have used like the, some of the technique that have been presented by uh, Cyril the day before, like whether you use FRAP or FCS to try to assess. But of course, this information is still uh, limited by diffraction. So you would see that things are recovering maybe faster here at the membrane compared to the adhesion side, but that's the global information you would get. And then luckily, SuperRes came, and the beauty of that is that you just have to, uh, because this is these uh, two colors, just switch this thing, change the laser, don't even need to activate at the beginning, and what you will see is the life of a few proteins uh, for some while. That's just really still amazing to look at this movie. It's very uh, simple, but what you see is that you, know, you start to see single molecules, this single protein, where they are, how they behave for a couple of what's the maximum second, but you can see that some of them are moving around, some of them are maybe less moving, and this is uh, what you, you do, and then from that, you start to do the analysis. Uh, localizations, everything I will talk about, and now you start to see that things are, of course, much uh, less homogeneous as, uh, as it can be seen from uh, diffraction limited because of lack of resolution, and you can start to resolve some details. Well, I'm good with that. Some uh, clustering, okay, compared to here. And of course, that what I will explain later is how we can get some quantitative information from this, so how we can get numbers uh, about this, this, this clustering. The other thing is that because this is live, you get trajectories, and then you extract the, for example, diffusion coefficient, and then the beauty of the thing is that mobility also gives you information on interaction with other proteins, and then now you can map where the nanoscale so, and correlates the, where are the molecules interacting with, with the partners. Okay, so this is what I will talk uh, about. So try to cover things from the acquisition, what is, uh, okay, best acquisition you can do at the single molecule level. So we'll stick to single molecule because it will be important for uh, the, the quantitative uh, information that you can extract for this. For this. And then we'll end with a little uh, application that we have, uh, in collaboration on, and the challenge for us to talk a little bit about the high content screening combined with single molecule regression microscopy and uh, ongoing collaboration we have the, with the group of uh, Dominique Bourgeois to uh, try to quantify the photophysics of, uh, and improve photophysics of uh, fluorescent protein. 
Okay, so this you know, so I will not go through that, I'll try to save the time. So you know the principle, uh, split uh, time and space your uh, fluorescence so that you are in the single molecule regime. And then if you have that, you can uh, digitally localize the position of your fluorophore and reconstruct the, the image with a high precision. Uh, what do you need to go from this low resolution to this? So it, again, that's the beauty of the technique. It's very simple. So you need like a labeling strategy. We've heard a lot of the different strategies to label and to be in a single molecule regime. You need to have a good optical sectioning microscope because, of course, you need to see single molecule events. So background needs to be uh, as low as possible. And of course, after that, you need a bunch of software, which is really part of the, the whole technique to localize. But, and after that, extract some qualitative information. But at least for the reconstruction, you need to localize individual molecules. OK, so this is uh, uh, tubulin LX-47. You switch in single molecule. So that will be my take home message. But for the people really uh, new in the, in the field, so I really encourage you to look at the single molecule. That's very, very important and not just only believe on what is the output of, of this. So you just need to guarantee, at least if your algorithms are really dedicated to localize single molecule to be sure that you are in the single molecule regime. And it's already a tricky, uh, tricky part, because if you're not, your algorithms will give you already some uh, important artifacts. And then you localize that. And this is the first step. You, in first, and it, you can see that, OK, the blinking is one thing. But if I just take a snapshot, you see that, OK, most of the molecules are in single molecule, but not everywhere. OK, you can see like every place. So the first step is really identifying where are my candidates of molecules. And the next step is to uh, fit, to try to extract with the best precision the coordinate at the center of these molecules so that we can reconstruct them. Uh, we can identify their position. So usual uh, model when you are in 2D uh, is the, the Gaussian fitting. So we'll stick with that. Uh, but of course, there are many other uh, approach, uh, more especially if you go to 3D, more complex uh, model, and you want to deal with aberrations. And, or, uh, but let's say for 2D, this is the, the, the ideal model for that. And then, of course, if you pull all the localization together, you're capable to reconstruct this uh, nice image with improved resolution that if you compare here, with the diffraction limited, and you can see that you can resolve a bunch of information that was not possible before. So we can stick with that. So OK, that's really fantastic. But of course, is, it, is this reconstruction optimal? Then maybe you can have a look at that. Oh, yes, before I need to talk about uh, how we quantify uh, the, the accuracy of the, the reconstruction. So we talk about localization precision, which is one uh, thing. Is if I repeat the equation of the same, uh, the same uh, uh, individual events, location events, and I repeat that and look at the spread and it's tell me how precise is my lo localization. So it depends on a few parameters. And mostly here, the background, the spread of the punishment function, and also mostly the noise here. Usually, uh, when you have a low background, you can put this uh, precision to here. Which give you, if you apply the formula, like Alexa 647, which is the best three or four for most of the people doing uh, this storm, you can achieve below 10 nanometer uh, location precision. But that's not enough for single molecule localization, because then you have like several scenarios, which has been uh, summarized recently in this, in this review, and you can say, OK, I can have like uh, low accuracy, but high precision. So now we also talk about accuracy. So because my location can be away from my target, that's for many different reasons, can be op for optical reasons can be for probe reasons, and it can be for, uh, I will ask another uh, scenario la later on. Depending on your noise, this is maybe what uh, the, mo the, the expectation is. If you have lower uh, noise, then you can decrease, in this case, the, uh, the precision. And then in this case, where you have a uh, high accuracy, because the whole has an average in the center, but you have a low precision. So the spread is, is bigger. And here, this is the ideal case where you have accuracy, high precision. And again, coming to my uh, initial uh, statement that if you have more than one uh, fluorophore that are shining at the same time, this is the worst case scenario when you can have like high precision, but mostly you can uh, detect the barycenter of a few molecules, which give you like a very uh, low accuracy in this case. The other point is, of course, it's not enough again, because then you have the location density. So we know this is a long process to get this information to, and to reconstruct them. And this was also highlighted in this review that if you don't have enough localization, even if you have like high accuracy, you will not be able to see 
information which is behind and of course the, the uh, any quantification will not be there so ideally you need to look at all your uh, molecules but at least enough so that you are capable to do some uh, correct reconstruction and uh, later on some analysis localization software so there are plenty so right after this uh, the, the the super res uh, so at least single molecule location microscopy rise so there's a big bunch of software uh, arising and i think there was like a very good uh, work from uh, daniel uh, daniel Sage, which is here uh, so recent pillar of the mifobio so was the uh, publish uh, and develop a fantastic uh, platform to uh, assess the quality of your of your uh, software package so for new developers but also for users and different scenario dif different uh, uh, 3d psf different signal to noise different density and then you can see of course this is not your data set but at least you can explore what are the the, the, the capability of your software with this different scenario it's a very useful tool Okay, so now talking about, uh, of course, before, uh, once you get this localization, then you need to reconstruct the image. Okay, again, something very simple for the users, but that's a few things behind that. So this is the low res, of course, one pixel, you don't see a lot of details because of the blur. But then, of course, when you localize, then you are sub pixel resolution. So you went with coordinates like this. And then usually what you do here is that you will project, you want to create an image, so you will project in a smaller grid like this so that you will finish with a similar density map of your localization which is similar to an intensity here and if you find it's a bit too much pixelated then you put a little bit of blur uh, with the blur something related to the accuracy two beers uh, uh, and then here you will get an image which looks familiar to what you have used and but with of course higher resolution this is what you do Okay, now let's look at the, what I told before, okay, what kind of artifact you can have when you do the reconstruction. So, so these are like from a, a D-Storm experiment, so 10,000 images, and then just take a few snapshots, and you can see that most of the time you can be in single molecule, this is what you expect, but a couple of times, you're not. And the problem is that because this is pure stochastic, still you have areas which have more probability to have more than one, and if typically if I overlap this with the reconstruction, you can see that areas we are where there are more molecules be as you clear a cross road like this, of course the chance to have more than one molecule at the same time will be there, and this is where you will make more URs. Okay, and then if I look at the reconstruction at the end, so this is the initial image, and then you can see because this is a template that you know that all the artifact is certainly here the contrast is not perfect, but you can see there's many localizations that you know they're just errors of localization and typically they are in between structure because sometimes they are two and they are not filtered out and then you cannot get and then here it's very easy if you take the a priori and this is also the beauty of single molecule if you want to be in single molecule it's very easy to put this a priori and filter out some of the molecules from some of the localization because they don't have the, pro the good property so here just filtering out like half of the localization based on their property that uh, are not uh, the one we expect for single molecule and you see that we clean perfectly the area which is here where there is high density here and then we are much cleaner that's very easy but still of course it posed the problem of uh, quantification behind not saying that it is uh, it has to be done all the time but still this there is already like an error easy on a template you know of course much more complicated when you don't know the structure which is behind just wanted to highlight this because this is a real problem okay this is zoom of that so now of course uh, talking about pixel based so why it is so these are three uh, four examples here of different publication we had and you can see that if you now reconstruct an image like in density based image like a, a intensity uh, like the one with that we call it usually that you can see that analyzing these four different images would require certainly well, sure very different strategies because the distributions here you see it is much more punctuated punctuated uh, you have this addition side that's the thing I took before is more filaments so here even more complex here uh, clustering so that's uh, that's the point and then that's that's a real problem and uh, of course people talk about artificial intelligence we can think that this would be uh, but I, I doubt that for this very different image we would have like a one general strategy but 
in single molecule we have the chance to have the coordinates so why to uh, start with this image while initially okay no there was another thing I want to say so now we have the, the coordinates so the question and then that we and other groups uh, raise that okay can we already take information and quantify information directly from the coordinates and not from the, the, uh, the image uh, this here. So, uh, and now I will enter this uh, analysis part, and then we have heard already a few uh, things. So, just by also uh, Wesley before. So, talking about one uh, application, which is the, the replay one, and then we usually uh, discriminate two families of analysis. So, we can talk about clustering, so getting an idea of whether my, uh, my uh, molecules are more or less clustered. That's what we heard before and get numbers from that, or we have like this more general approach of segmentation. So try to group molecules together maybe, and, uh, and, and try to get information on the size of the cl I say clusters uh, or structure which are uh, labeled. And then we are like a, a few families which are popular in the field, so the scan tessellation, machine learning base, uh, many, and then we'll cover just a couple of that and send you the so the one that has been explained before, so we'll go very quick, is the replay function. So the idea is really to, to analyze the distribution of your molecules, so like, like kind of look at the, the uh, density uh, with, uh, with the distance for each molecule. So we usually use the, uh, what's called the normal uh, replay function, so the edge replay function, and this is what has been done uh, before. So if you compare like, uh, a scenario where your molecules are kind of clusterized, you can see here, versus uh, normal, uh, uh, let's say, more random uh, distribution. So what you will get in these two cases is that you will look and do the analysis on how, what is the, um, as a distance around each molecule, so what is the density of my molecules, and you can see that when it is homogeneous, you can have like a flat distribution around zero, but when it is clusterized, you will see that you will have an increase as a radius similar to what show uh, uh, before Wesley, and then if you have just clusters of homogeneous size, then we'll have like a peak and a decrease, which will give you the, the rough idea of the radius of your clusters. So it works when you have like really homogeneous and has been used in, in many papers uh, initially, but of course, as soon as you get something more complex like, like this one, where you have like clearly different levels of uh, organization, then here you will get this uh, bump here that you can see that we showed with clusters maybe around 100 nanometers but here is a bit more complex because you have like a function which raising like this you can see this bump here which is the same here uh, here we, we go further but then of course there is another level of organization that is a bit harder to, to quantify if you don't have again any model uh, with that so then comes the, uh, the way to uh, the, the, the segmentation technique, and certainly one of the most popular is the DBSCAN uh, approach. So the idea is to classify every single localization depending on, where, depending on their density. Okay, and then you define, the density is defined by two parameters, is the radius, which is the neighborhood of each molecule, and then the number of localization that you have inside, which the two together define the density. Okay, so that's uh, how things work. So typically you have to, to define these two parameters. So let's say that we define the distance which can be like something close to the resolution, for example. So you can fix the, the, ra the radius of search for your molecules. And then that's one of the limits of the of technique that you have two parameters that you can set to define the density is to uh, fix a threshold and the minimum number of localization to define a cluster. And then you have like three, uh, three group of molecules. You need to classify your molecule based on that. And you will say, okay, if my number of molecules around in the given ra radius is less than or equal to four, then it is part of a cluster. So then you can say, okay, this molecule is five molecules. That's part of a cluster. And uh, if you have another molecule, which is like this one, for example, it has like two molecules, but it's part of my neighbors. I have one part of the cluster, so I say that's label as an edge, uh, okay? And finally, if you have this isolated uh, localization, then you can say, okay, this one is, uh, is, uh, is noise. And then you do that for all the molecules, and then at the end, you end with this uh, classification of three families, so clusters, boundary of your clusters, and background. 
works. Of course, if you have like a, uh, some distribution, you play with these two parameters and you will easily be able to clusterize your, uh, your molecules and then get by proximity that this is a cluster, another one, and so on and so forth. Of course, the problem is when it gets more complicated, like this one, with different level of, uh, uh, of organization, then if you apply the same uh, parameter, then you will have to, to play here with this parameter. So it's okay, now I will change. So maybe this is a bit denser. I will change the minimum uh, number of points that define, so the threshold that define uh, the, the density, and you will end with another classification of your molecule that works, but then of course I will miss some of them. We can see that there is some limit and more especially complicated to normalize because after that if you want to compare condition together, this can be a little problem. You don't have always room to adjust automatically these two parameters. So it's already complex within the same sample, but of course when you start to compare. But again, that works. Uh, so we and others think about another uh, approach, uh, which is the tessellation-based technique, and then you have like the, the two approaches. So uh, actually, there was a technique that people were working like uh, many years back, 20 to, to 30 years in very different fields, like uh, compression, uh, data compression that I remember, and people work uh, in the lab during my PhD thesis, and uh, I thought, and other group at the same time, that that's perfectly adapted to the single molecule uh, field. So what are these techniques? So they are subdividing uh, space. So the idea is to describe the image to subdivide the whole space just from with polygons, OK? So this is in the case of the Dolonet triangulation. So the idea is that you will connect the neighbors here to define the space. And you can see that triangles, so in dense region, you have small triangles. In, uh, in, in uh, sparse region, you have bigger triangles. And now you have a non-even uh, a description of your uh, divi uh, division of your space. So it's not like before you have like one pixel, which is a very large uh, pixel, which for the whole image. No, in this case, you divide your pixel depending on where your localization. <coughs> and then you can use that with a single parameter, which is okay. What is the distance cut? We call the distance cut. You do that, and then it's very easy. This algorithm, the super fast uh, version, and then you can here very easily segment your uh, and then do the detection. Here, of course, same problem arise when you have like different organization, uh, level of organization, because the same parameter, you have one parameter, you cannot, but still you define like uh, other classes. So on our side, we uh, decided to work uh, not on the Delaunay, but on the Voronoi diagram, which is the, the dual, um, uh, and everything I would say, that's the, the work that, uh, that you know from Florian, which I will highlight a bit uh, later. So, uh, the Dolonet, uh, so the Dolonet is the one I presented before, connecting the, the nearest neighbor and, um, in triangles. And the other one, the problem conceptually is that, of course, that you have one share, uh, so you have distances, but you have like, for each molecule, you have several uh, neighbors, depending on whether you take the neighbors or the triangle, so it's always something shared with others. So, like, uh, especially the Voronoi uh, idea, which is the dual. Again, you can really reconstruct one from the from the other. These are big sectors from the from the connection here. So it defines polygons. So in this case, it's easier because you have one polygon per molecule, which is of course defined from the neighborhood. And then with that, uh, you can very easily define one parameter, which is the density. So typically, you have the density, which we can define a different scale. We didn't really explore that, but I'm sure there are many. Uh, 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 things behind that we could uh, explore, uh, but we can say, okay, let's let's take this molecule, so we uh, can define the density by the the, third, the number of molecules, which is one by the area here, or I can take the the surrounding molecules to define like another area at the second scale around the, uh, around the molecule and so on and so forth. And because they are very collecting, it's very easy to navigate here, and this is, uh, again, the work of Florian to have like a real structure which is very efficient to navigate in a neighborhood and to use this as a, uh, uh, as a, as a quantitative measurement to, to uh, do the segmentation. So at the end, you can make different type of reconstruction and then you can reconstruct images as well. So it's, it's uh, so very nice. So you can, uh, whatever metrics you have, you can draw and then you can uh, color uh, your uh, polygon by metrics you want. So here this is the density and you can end with some density map like this and just threshold on this parameter. 
threshold lane is exactly the same as before, so what threshold I have to use? So the idea is that, okay, there's two different scenarios where the density is different on the simulation, and definitively, I, I see that the cutoff here is very simple thing. So you have the background, I have the, the object. So in the, the first population, I have the threshold here, and the second population is here. So of course, it's not normalized, and that's always a problem. We want to compare conditions together. So we had to find with a simple solution to have the technique normalized. So two papers uh, for that. So I, we did the very simple uh, thing, which is the very start, uh, the, the at least a, a good beginning to say, okay, let's take the average density, okay, and then do the uh, normalized den density. And then if you do just normalize by the, the average den den density of your molecules, then you have the, the two distribution which uh, nicely overlap. You can also do Monte Carlo simulation to get maybe a more accurate value, but in this case, it will take a lot of time. So the idea is to find a good compromise between uh, the time it takes to put the, the, the threshold. And still, we can play a little bit with this. Okay, so that's the, the point. So again, so you do the whole pipeline. So you start, you do your, your Voronoi, you do the, the uh, density map. You see that just plotting with density, so now the image looks very, uh, very, very clear that you can see the clusters here. Uh, okay, and so on and so forth. So then you can end with this. And then, of course, we have the similar problem. Okay, we, we do the cutoff, we compare to the uh, normal distribution, and then we can see that now we have clusters. And in this case, we have these big clusters. So we say, okay, now this is another level of, uh, uh, of aggregation. So let's not take a, uh, we know we won't be able to have one threshold for all the technique, but we can say, okay, let's segment this as an object. And then we can do the same inside because we have an internal distribution. And then we do like a next level segmentation inside. So take the whole localization, look at the distribution and threshold inside with this uh, normalized value, which will, is exactly the same as outside. And then now we can get a, a, the, the cluster distribution inside the addition site as well. Okay, so at the end, you, you end with this uh, distribution where we can like have this, this four level uh, segmentation. So from the background, the cell, the addition site in blue, and then the clusters, which can be outside or inside uh, the cluster. Okay, so once you get a cluster, now you want to do, uh, of course, the, uh, the quantification of that. So you have, uh, that's true for all the, uh, the methods. So now you need to count the, the localization inside and you want to get numbers. So you, of course, there are several ways to uh, describe these clusters, whether you put an a priori or not on that. So you can very basically just take the outline of the, of the, of the molecules here and then make some, some quantification or you can put like ellipse or you can do like, principal component analysis to, to get numbers because you want to, to quantify. Of course, the question that we all have behind that has been uh, so discussed a little bit during the, uh, the, the other presentation is, oh no, that's, that's the, the, the clustering uh, thing I wanted to just to highlight. So just like a few methods I, I presented, but similar to localization, a bit less, but a lot of techniques have been developed and are still under development for the clustering, which is a very hot topic. Uh, here, directly from the coordinates, and again, there's the work from the group of uh, Dylan that will group a few people in the in the field and try to uh, come with uh, so some data set and some metrics and different scenario to be able to assess the efficiency of the given algorithms for diff different uh, scenario to uh, be able to uh, to do the segmentation. So again, this is not your data. It doesn't mean that this will work for your data, but at least you can find. Uh, so for developers, that's a good tool. But also for, uh, for you as a user, you can explore first, explore uh, all the, the techniques which are available because that's uh, supposed to be, uh, to be leading. So new technique will be around, similar to localization, uh, to the paper I liked before for localization. And also you can try to identify scenario which are similar to your scenario and then go into in there and maybe explore some of the algorithm that could be more suited for your problem. Okay, so I don't need to talk about 2D, but of course 3D is something important and an uh, opportunity to highlight this, uh, this. So typically we and others are working on 3D location microscopy. So this is the, the work of a few uh, people in the, in the team, but also uh, but mostly aided by, uh, by Remy. 
so we have developed a technique to allow 3D single molecule localization uh, in depth. So depth, let's say, several layers as something similar than uh, Wesley just presented before, but with the geometry of the, of the source beam. So it means that now we end with a big 3D cloud of molecules, and of course, everything I said before is functional. So here this is like, uh, I don't know how many sections, 35 planes. It's a long acquisition time because it was a uh, regular DNA, DNA paint, but at the end, you end with like uh, several hundred of thousands of uh, localization. This is PD1 res receptor and uh, Joka cell. And uh, of course, now we are interested in qualified the uh, location in 3D, so uh, and uh, so now the opportunity to uh, showcase the, uh, the work of uh, Florian, which is the new release of the software, which used to be a SFSLR in 3D, and now a point load analyst in, in 3D, which is capable, uh, which has an improved engine uh, to uh, analyze this 3D cloud of, uh, of data. So he has like a second workshop if you want to attend. So I think it's on yeah, Wednesday, uh, 3 p.m., 2 p.m. Actually, so this is, uh, this is the, the new opus, so this I can show on the data, so you, you have various ways to represent. It's really fast, can handle millions of localization in, a, in a less than a minute to reconstruct like a 3D Voronoi, like 4 million, so it's really like being improved to handle 3D data with an advanced rendering engine here, and then after that behind, everything I say in 2D works in 3D. So it's not only about the method that we have published, like the, the, the Verona in, in, in 3D, but also in, in, um, integrates other uh, methods. And so, so the idea of this platform is really to be able to have other developers to use the visualization uh, engine to, uh, to, uh, to plug their uh, new, new development. So it's pretty open uh, in that, uh, in the, this idea. So just to highlight, so now what just show in 2D, before work in 3D, of course, much less complicated to see this, let's say, uh, tetrahedron or something like this here. But you have the same philosophy looking at the distribution. So now you, we talk about density in 3D. You have the, the, the thing, it's all normalized. You put your, your cutoff here, and then you are able now to get, so it's not super visible. Now we have clusters here. So the clusters is the same. As before, now clusters are objects by themselves, so that you can really pick every single object, look at the properties, and then you get all the statistics for your, for your clusters, where you can count uh, molecules, uh, localization, and get some uh, morpho, uh, morphology uh, qu qu quantification. Okay. But also we thought it was uh, so interesting for a question is to also analyze not only the cluster by themselves, but the distribution of the cluster. You can say, okay, every cluster, uh, which is a group of localization, possibly a group of molecules, has a special distribution. And we know that in 3D, this can be interested whether you have a polarization, because it's not like 2D flat surface. Now we're talking about 3D. So something can be, of course, non-isotropic uh, in the distribution. Uh, and here, this is just the distribution of your clusters now, which you can use the same regular analysis to analyze how much they are uh, clustered or organized at the surface. So here, this is easy. This is like, like a sphere. You can have like, this is all the, the type of visualization you can make to understand and also to quantify behind. So this is a surface mapping on a sphere. And now you can come back to this polygonal analysis and look at where are the uh, Clusters more uh, concentrated, uh, uh, cl uh, yeah, clusters of molecule mo or receptor mostly concentrated uh, in 3D. So this type of new features that we are uh, continuing to implement. Okay, now of course our topic is can we count? So now we have objects, we can quantify their surface, maybe their volume, and of course now is what is about inside. So what is the num number of locations? Now, of course that was the initial uh, uh, thought that single molecule will be able to do molecular counting and we know that's not that easy and the problem is the, f is the photophysics. So what people do, and I think similar to uh, intensity, uh, to, to, to density image, is that we do stoichiometry. That's, no, abs absolute stoichiometry is, uh, is, a real, uh, is a real issue, but what is uh, maybe easier is to do some ratiometric measurements. So if you have like, some object of reference, like a template that you know 
how many molecules, then there is a chance if you compare with that to be able to count uh, or at least have an idea of how many molecules I have in another cluster as a reference to my reference. Uh, of course, we have all the issue of the okay, photophysical properties, what happens when they, we have a very crowded environment uh, and that the, the blinking can, can change, so that's, that's, uh, that's true, but this is what you, we usually uh, do. The absolute counting is, of course, much more of a complex, even though we are trying to, to do that. So this is typically what's been done here in the, initial, uh, in the initial work. So we have ideas of, we have reference that we can use to quantify how many of these reference in, into a more complex object. Yeah. So of course, counting molecule with, uh, with uh, uh, GFP, uh, fusion protein, uh, is certainly on the paper the easiest way because you can say that your molecule gets on for a while and will bleach. We know that if we look into the, so here if you have six, uh, six domain here, you can expect to have six bursts if you, and because we can find, uh, uh, co control the, the density of activation, expect to have them separated in time. But of course, if I look inside that, so we have some blinks here. And this blink, we need to take them into account, so we can recruit them if are, they are sparsely distributed in time enough. But we know that sometimes it's not as easy because they have this long dark state that Dominic is obsessed about, yes. like that they can kill. Of course, then uh, maturation is also a problem uh, that you can eventually uh, measure on templates again and try to compensate here. So that's the, uh, that's the thing. And it will provide undercounting. So you can overcounting. Because of the blinking, you can have uh, undercounting. So at the end, it becomes quite of a mess. Not that easy, but this year's counting with antibodies is certainly more complex because of the block blinking properties that goes all over uh, the time. So, and the idea is that you will completely mix the, the, the thing. Labeling, of course, is, has to be like the uh, optimal for that, but even uh, the antibody uh, penetration, the uh, the one-to-one, the -one, so exploiting the Blinking properties for counting is is a, is a bit of a, of a problem, and in this case you come back to uh, to some ratiometric me measurement that, that is supposed to work, and your technique, which has been uh, presented by Mike uh, the day before, is Yenapain, which is a so very interesting technique where you have your again your object of reference, which will give you the the clock defined by the uh, K off here, the off state, and the more uh, so the, uh, so the more uh, protein you have, uh, so the more uh, off-state you will get, and this is how you will refer and count your number of events for a given concentration of, uh, of imager. If we get distribution, okay, that works on the paper. That's <coughs> tracking, I will go very fast because it's been said and I don't have really time, so tracking is very uh, straightforward. So if you use these this molecules that you have been shown before, that they are on for some time and, uh, and then and off uh, after some while, then you can get their life, the mobility over time. So you connect the, the point together. There are many algorithms as well. And then typically you have some distribution of events, of trajectories, and then from which you can extract more or less complex uh, behavior. So the longer, the more uh, complex behavior you can get, and after that you you do like so the, let's say the most uh, classical way to analyze is the by mean square uh, displacement, which gives you information about the diffusive behavior that exists for a long time, and then you will do this. You get this instant mobility, and as as in the short term, um, in the, uh, in the short term um, uh, displacement. And when you explore further away in time, then you will get uh, information about confinement, possibly. And of course, this is characterized uh, since, uh, of course, way longer before SuperRes, because the field of single particle tracking, again, that has been uh, presented also uh, rapidly uh, by, uh, by Serial. So this exists for uh, this model, they exist, and then they work pr pretty well to classify your molecules. And this is typically how we ended with this kind of map. Okay, so uh, I think I'm over to, to this, and I just want to uh, finish uh, by this little presentation of uh, the next challenge. So, okay, we see capability of single molecule microscopy 
to be quantitative, to provide numbers with sensitivity that uh, the wide field microscopy may not have, because you can really count single molecule events and get uh, quite quantitative information at the nanoscale. So uh, a few years back, we, uh, we had like ideas, even like more than 10 years ago, to use this as a readout uh, to, to screen molecules. So the mobility, the clustering, which can be like a very powerful uh, readout. Um, and uh, so the challenge, and we ended with this uh, solution, with uh, trying to combine high content screening, which is really like the complete automated fashion to collect, analyze, represent several biological conditions in a single workflow, which is a lot because you know this technique is, is pretty uh, time consuming and, and, and quite uh, so uh, strict in terms of uh, recruitment and quality of the image. And of course, then it raised several challenges for BS. I will get drunk. Huh? Uh, so just this is the stats for one cell here typically compared to what uh, the goal of a 96 well plan typically that you can get. So then you have to multiply by 1,000. So if you at the end one cell versus 1,000, which, which means at the end of the day possible, depending on your photophysics and what you want to measure, and with something like 10 billion localization to, uh, to analyze. It's a lot of information. But that's the, the, the interest of the thing. And of course, it raised several challenges, technical challenges. So how do we have the system stable for that long with the, the fluorophore also uh, in the, the same condition and the same, with the same photophysical properties? Because we know that this is an important point for the quantification. So you need to, to stay in, cope, in focus, be precise in, uh, in many respects, and of course, you need to have a software that do not crash, otherwise that will never reach the, the end. Of course, the time is, is, a, is a problem. It's the, it's the time, of course, not only for the acquisition, but the time was possibly the, the raw data, which I didn't say, or oh, the raw data come here, terabytes of raw data images. So it means that if you collect terabytes of data and then you wait, uh, the, the other, it will take a week to just load them, analyze them. And then from that, you extract gigabytes of metadata, which is much smaller, but then you need to use them to, to the analysis. And of course, you need to represent that. Visualization, analysis, classification, this is what you want. You have hundreds of descriptors, which describe here. So, and then we have developed this, uh, this thing, like uh, several uh, years ago, um, almost 10 years ago. So the first brick of the thing was this uh, software that we developed. It was the work of a um, first PhD student, actually, in, uh, in Bordeaux develop a software which is capable to analyze the single molecule data in real time. So that was like the first breakthrough, uh, we, uh, one of the first uh, development we did in the field. And the idea is that even at any speed of the camera, you can localize your molecules. And this localization is already that at the end of the acquisition, you have the statistic, you have the position. You need to load them. And of course, there's a huge compression uh, of data. And we could also use this to feed back to the microscope to adjust the laser so that your uh, blinking remains the, more or less the same if you go to bleaching or whatsoever. And then a second piece of software, which was the, the work of uh, Anne and, uh, and Marine in the, the team, was to develop the whole high content screening pipeline. So how to have this, but not, of course, for a single field, for many, the 96 well plate or like a bunch of plates with the detection of cells at the low level or uh, random the uh, exploration of each individual field and going from one to, to the other and uh, so on and so forth. So this is the whole pipeline. I will not go through it, but the idea is really like you, you go through this once you have set up the, the condition, the system is all calibrated and you will extract the metadata, most of them in real time, which is so very important, which means at the end of the day, you have the data to analyze and then you can present them like you do this heat map, which is a classical way for a given set of parameters uh, here. And then this, uh, but you also extract like a huge database of inf quantitative information. Depending on the question you have, you can pick them all and do possibly some machine learning to try to classify uh, all of this. So this is the type of metadata. And of course, we can add uh, on top of that. So mostly related to everything I presented before. So of course, this is the coordinates and also something very important. The, the the quality of the so information about the, the single molecule event. This is why I think it's important, because if you have the single molecule event, you can also assess the quality, the reproducibility, and many, many things about also the, the OK, maybe something wrong in the uh, optical setup, but also in the, in the photophysics. 
and this is like where we have the control here, okay? And then we also have a, a, a set of parameters to describe the photophysics, like the tyranny of duty cycle and many other parameters here, which are important. And this is the dynamic thing, so we can automatically in real time extract the trajectories up to the uh, diffusion coefficients. And finally, everything about what I talked before on the um, clustering that we can extract here, the shape descriptors of every single cluster, so POCA is part of the pipeline as well. Uh, demonstrated that, okay, that works. We can do a super ray for some while. Uh, this is, I don't know, uh, 10 hours or even more acquisition of uh, this storm uh, here in 3D. And from that, we can extract some coordinate expect and represent them. So we speak some parameters of a combination of, of uh, these uh, metadata and then represent them. So it was like the evolution of the quality of the, of the blinking, which show that it degrade after a few hours. But that's the, uh, that's the thing. Okay, I now want to, to finish off one application uh, that we uh, had in mind and we uh, luckily uh, could uh, get funds with uh, the group of uh, Dominique and uh, Mathieu St. Louis in the, in the lab to use this platform with the expectation to develop or at least to first better characterize and later on possibly develop new, uh, more stable uh, uh, GFP or photoconvertible fluorescent protein which I, I say before, Dominique is obsessed about that, so I hope we can progress on that. Now, but I think it's really, as like a fantasy, I think you know uh, his work, so it's uh, really like a deeply characterizing what today prevents uh, to do uh, some, uh, some quantitative uh, analysis from what we were expecting at the beginning of the, uh, of the method to be able to do uh, some molecular counting, so do some better tracking and so on and so forth. So for that, yeah, like a bunch of tools to characterize uh, this, all these this, uh, this, uh, dark effects, so how to improve the, the, the signal, but also um, so what is toxic in, the, in there and how we can prove that. So once we identify some, uh, some, uh, some mutations, so that's uh, Mathieu Sanlos, which is a chemist in the, in the institute, uh, is uh, capable to, to come. So he's also working a lot on the ligands and the protein engineering, and then he's, uh, he's capable to do uh, some, uh, with direct evolution, some uh, mu mutations. And then uh, our part is to use the instrument I just uh, showed before with the bunch of analysis tools. And as a team with the, the Bordeaux Imaging Center, we have two different setups which are capable to do that. So we, uh, we can do that in, in parallel with the help of uh, Magali. So one important thing is, uh, is when you want to do that character, just to be sure you're in single molecule. As I said before, it's important to be in single molecule <coughs> regime. And also if you want to get numbers, just to be sure that you don't have, for example, overlapping. So you need to control precisely the density of, uh, of uh, fluorescent protein to be sure you don't have any bias on that. And you want this to be a parameter. Otherwise, you can really corrupt. And then uh, Mathieu developed a pretty interesting uh, uh, system, which is PyTax, PyCatch, to really attach your fluor for your uh, um, uh, genetically encoded uh, photoconvertible for some protein here. So we it's just start with a big protein like this, which is uh, stick on the will stick on the glass cover slip, and then we mix with another same protein on which he has a spike catcher uh, technique. And then if you now release in solution your fluorescent some protein with the little tags, so will it will covalently linked to this pie catcher, and this is how we can precisely control by the mixture of this one, this, uh, the, the distribution. So ID of your fluor 4. Ideally, we want it to, to be like a very, uh, to have like a distribution, which is to guarantee that we were uh, more than the diffraction limited apart, but we realize that under classical illumination, this would be a problem because it would take forever before we get too, much, too, too many statistics. So then we explore many different uh, a dilution, so there was the, the work of Abdel in the team, with uh, Loris also, with the uh, team of, uh, of Mathieu, to be able to try to find the best compromise between density and analysis, just to guarantee that we have something robust in terms of uh, photophysics. Okay, so this is what we ended here, with a given what we think, so we still uh, are characterizing, so this is what we end, so this is now we have very reproducible way 
to uh, to do this, uh, to do this experiment, and also just to be sure that we have the same density all the time, it's very reproducible. Co do a lot of control about positive, negative control, which is part of the screen. So this is the whole pipeline now. We have this multi-well plates, so we have different condition here, this uh, thing, and then we can attach several, uh, of course, variants and illuminate them under diff different condition. Provide this database, and of course, what we measure is all about these uh, photophysical uh, parameters. But we decided that you can see here we are not in the single protein uh, level. Okay, they are a bit denser, but we have, of course, uh, characterized that we have no bias, and then this is the optimal condition that with a limited number of acquisition or uh, frames, we can extract the photophysical parameters. Okay, so of course we uh, have used all the quantitative measurement to just to be sure that it is homogeneously distributed. So, so very important because photophysics, or at least what you want to characterize, is intensity dependent. And what you and uh, to guarantee that we are in single molecule when things are connected together. So we have like a, this temporal separation of single molecule event, just uh, with threshold that we discuss with uh, with Dominic, just to guarantee that when we have a cluster and if they have like temporal signature which are uh, far enough one to each other that you have several protein at the same time that we can separate them and uh, extract individual photophysics. And this is what you end uh, at the end of the day. So these are preliminary data. So the idea is uh, initially was to try to see whether we could retrieve at least what is uh, published. So we have several uh, of these uh, variant of uh, MAOs here. And then we can measure this uh, all a bunch of parameters and try to see where we can expect to improve for a given uh, properties. Okay, and uh, this is what the uh, expectation will be. So this is like a first uh, icon and screen. It's very preliminary. So to try so uh, different buffers, uh, different conditions, also different concentration. We need to have, of course, all the time positive control, negative control with protein of reference, just to be sure that each time we can retrieve what we have to, and there is no uh, bias, and then overall we can screen many different uh, uh, protein under di different condition, and also explore new variants when we will uh, have them. Okay, so I'm done. So this global take home message, which I say all over uh, the place. So my uh, I prone for uh, really like uh, this uh, single molecule being prone to artifact, and of course you need to look at the raw data, use the tool guarantee or filter out that you are in the single molecule regime. Of course, there are great promises with this uh, high density, which will relieve the question of time, because that's really time consuming. Uh, but so far, uh, there is nothing better than a single molecule signal to guarantee that you, are, you have a single molecule and not an artifact. And uh, OK, that's the, that's the point. There's many uh, do. Uh, okay, and of course, studying always like a need of control solution. So templates, nano templates, whatsoever, to really have your structure of reference so that you are able to make some control all along your uh, pipeline of acquisition. And with this, I'm done. And of course, want to thank the people from my team. So this is the actual team and the people. I think I didn't forget to mention during the. the my presentation, which is the actual uh, students were, or uh, engineers, researcher working here, the former uh, P uh, PhD students, or postdoc working on this uh, project, and our collaborators here. So, thanks for your attention. Thanks for the very nice talk, Jean Baptiste. Um, one, uh, I really liked your overview of all the quantitative analysis methods. Um, I, one thing you didn't mention about was uh, particle averaging approaches for... So again? One thing you didn't mention was uh, the particle averaging approaches. Yes, I, exactly. Yeah, and, yeah. But uh, are you thinking about including this in the POCA software or... The, um, uh, because it's also that's a good idea, so certainly because we have no project on that, but that's clear that uh, now that would make sense. So typically there is always like some kind of dream in the in the institute to try to resolve some of the structure of, uh, of some receptors. And clearly this, this could, could be a solution. And uh, once yeah. we, yeah. Cool. And um, one more question, the, for your modeling of the, um, the kinetics of the switching of the fluorescent proteins, did you like, how many state model um, do you think about for those, for those systems? Um, you know, because I think that they, they, can display some more complex kinetics than the 
Then the dice sometimes. Ah, but it's for Dominic, you think? That's for me. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, what? No, actually, on what I presented right now is just, okay, all the quantitative numbers we can extract from that. So, yeah. of course, we have no model uh, behind. And, of course, uh, Dominic has a <laughs> lot of model to try to fit the data we have with some of the model he has to try to explain some of the triple state. I think he can uh, answer better than, than I do. So, it's not part of the pipeline per se. It's the idea is to extract these values. Yeah and try to fit them into uh, many uh, two di different models. And we have like some very uh, bizarre <laughs> localization which do not fit some of the model. And that's really something that we can here try to, to focus on. And uh, so that's really like back and forth from the data we have of the, of the Blink yeah. to try to, to fit and maybe improve some of the uh, model that we, that we have. That's the, the, the idea. But yeah, on the model itself, I, I leave more uh, only, uh, Dominique. Uh, okay. Cool. Yes. And just to be clear about one thing, the people who left during the questions don't count for the beers. No, uh, no, no, it's okay. Uh, you I've, can been, I've enough already. Okay. I've enough. Well, if you need I, more. I count, I count, uh, I count eight. That's, that's okay. eight. It's, it's, uh, it's and not to bad. be four liters. Um, do we have more questions? Hi, Jean Baptiste. Uh, I was wondering on the, the high content screening for like the protein engineering quantification, how are you controlling the density of the model? It looked like they were on like a lawn of, I think I missed that part at the so very end. The, the density of the, of the, uh, this is the, the, the spy, the spy tag, spy catch uh, thing. Yes. This one that's here. Or maybe you don't see from here. So, uh, yeah, we have this, uh, the, the, the system where we can really control density of, of the fluo4 uh, because they are engineer with this little each time we want to screen with that they are engineer with this this little tag which will be attached to uh, to this uh, big uh, protein and then with a very controlled uh, dilution of the two one which the spy tag was uh, one without then we can really control precisely the uh, the density of this thing gotcha and, and then maybe follow up question on that is do, have you seen or do you expect to see any differences from having kind of this in vitro lawn surface compared to say in the cell in different biochemical environments or you know ph different yeah, mitochondria the, the or but nucleus and things what we can do here is we can change the, the environment very easily and play with that as a, as a parameter so that's that's the idea of course inside the cell we know it deep we can have a, like, even a gradient of things but that's something we can try we can also play with the oxygen we can play with the really the initial uh, thing we can play with the illumination strategy as well so shine with different type of lasers and see now in, well, in a pretty qualitative manner where do we can we, where can we improve the the, the photophysics so it can be by engineering but it so it can be also by many other strategies like illuminating or, yeah, and then uh, yeah, that's uh, so something some of the work that uh, Dominic de demonstrated that using some of the in, uh, intensity shining low to uh, avoid some, uh, some some dark state for example so that's also some, something that we could imagine to play so we have really like a like super playground to play with all these parameters because we can control all, all of these during the, the screen and that's the, the idea behind it. But we, we struggle quite a lot to to have like uh, to try the best compromise to attach this uh, this raw form in a very uh, reproducible manner, including the analysis. But I think now we are entering this this, this phase where we can play with all these parameters. Cool. Thanks.